By 4 billion years ago, Earth had settled into relative calm. Oceans lapped against volcanic islands, the crust thickened into early continents, the sky glowed orange with organic haze, lightning flickered across the warm atmosphere, and hydrothermal systems seethed along spreading ridges. Within this environment, chemistry took a decisive step toward biology. Carbon combined with nitrogen, hydrogen, and phosphorus to form complex molecules capable of storing information and replicating. The boundary between geochemistry and life blurred, and somewhere on this world of water and rock, the first living systems arose. All the clues about how life began are indirect. Scientists piece them together from ancient rocks, tiny fossils, and the chemistry of living cells. The oldest widely accepted signs of life come from rocks in Greenland that are about 3.8 billion years old, containing carbon that looks like it was processed by living things. Genetic evidence suggests that a single common ancestor of all life existed even earlier, around 4 billion years ago, meaning that life appeared surprisingly soon after the intense bombardment of Earth by asteroids had stopped. The young planet offered abundant raw materials. Volcanoes vented carbon dioxide, nitrogen, hydrogen, methane, and ammonia. Ultraviolet radiation, electric discharges, and geothermal energy provided the power to drive synthesis. In the atmosphere, lightning sparked reactions among these gases, while in the oceans, metal-rich vents catalyzed further complexity. The Earth was a vast chemical reactor. In 1953, scientists ran an experiment showing that sparks of electricity in a mix of simple gases could create amino acids the building blocks of life. Later versions of the experiment, using gases like those from volcanoes, also produced other important ingredients such as acids and parts of genetic molecules. Today, researchers think Earth's early atmosphere wasn't as chemically rich everywhere, but in certain places, near volcanoes, lightning storms, or meteor impacts, the right conditions for life's chemistry could still have existed. Some meteorites, like the famous Murchison meteorite that fell in 1969, contain more than 80 different amino acids and other complex organic molecules similar to those found in living things. The chemical makeup of these materials shows they came from space. In Earth's early history, countless meteorites and comets brought huge amounts of this organic material, adding to, rather than replacing, the chemical building blocks already forming on Earth. Beneath the early oceans, tectonic and volcanic activity produced networks of submarine vents. At mid-ocean ridges, seawater percolated into hot basalt, reacted with minerals, and emerged as plumes laden with hydrogen, methane, and sulfides. Where these fluids mixed with cold seawater, minerals precipitated into chimneys, creating steep chemical and thermal gradients ideal environments for complex reactions. Today's deep sea vents come in different types. Some, called black smokers, are extremely hot and rich in metals. Others, like the lost city vents in the Atlantic, are cooler and alkaline. These form when certain rocks react with seawater, releasing hydrogen and creating tiny natural chambers with chemical energy. Inside these spaces, Simple carbon molecules such as formate, acetate, and methane can form, the same kinds of molecules that living cells use for energy and growth. Lab experiments have shown that thin layers of iron and nickel sulfides can help spark the creation of simple energy-rich molecules, the kind that may have powered early life. These reactions resemble those used in one of the most ancient ways living cells make energy today. In other words, the chemistry around hydrothermal vents may have provided both the building blocks and the energy systems that early life needed to begin. Studies of ancient sulfur minerals show chemical patterns that suggest microbes were already using sulfur for energy more than 3.4 billion years ago. These patterns match what would expect from life that developed around hydrothermal vents, using the natural chemical differences between hot, 
hydrogen-rich fluids and cooler, sulfate-rich seawater to power its metabolism. At some point, geochemical complexity gave rise to molecules capable of both storing information and catalyzing reactions. Ribose nucleic acid, RNA, can serve both functions. It can encode sequences and fold into catalytic shapes known as ribozymes. The RNA world hypothesis proposes that before DNA and proteins, life was based on RNA self-replication within confined microenvironments such as mineral pores or lipid vesicles. Experiments have shown that activated nucleotides can polymerize on clay minerals such as monmorillonite, forming RNA chains tens of bases long. RNA molecules can evolve new catalytic activities through iterative selection in vitro, including self-ligation and partial replication. The modern ribosome, a ribozyme that catalyzes peptid bond formation, is considered a living fossil of this early era. The main difficulty lies in prebiotic synthesis of ribose and nucleobases under plausible early Earth conditions. Recent studies using ultraviolet irradiation of cyanide-derived intermediates yield simultaneous formation of ribonucleotides, suggesting that an integrated photochemical pathway could have operated on the early Earth surface. Genetic studies suggest that all life today shares a single ancient ancestor, a simple organism that used RNA-based enzymes and only a few basic proteins. This ancestor likely gained energy by reacting hydrogen with carbon dioxide and by fixing nitrogen, much like some microbes found around hydrothermal vents today. These similarities hint that life's first systems may have grown directly from the chemistry of the early Earth. Other hypotheses complement or compete with the RNA world. The metabolism-first model posits self-sustaining chemical cycles, such as iron sulfur catalysis, that predated genetic polymers. The lipid world suggests that amphiphilic molecules spontaneously formed vesicles enclosing reaction networks. Panspermia envisions microbial life arriving from space on meteorites, a mechanism demonstrated possible but not necessary. Current consensus holds that multiple processes operated together. Geochemical energy supplied raw organics, self-assembling membranes provided compartments, RNA-like molecules arose within these niches and gradually evolved heredity. By 3.9 billion years ago, the prebiotic Earth had crossed a threshold. Chemical systems capable of replication and metabolism began to outcompete purely abiotic processes. Within the sheltered niches of hydrothermal vents, clay flats, and tide pools, microscopic compartments formed, droplets, vesicles, or mineral pores enclosing catalytic cycles. Natural selection, operating at the molecular level, began to sculpt complexity. The first true cells appeared, small, anaerobic organisms feeding on the chemical energy of their environment. Studies of modern genetics show that every living thing on Earth can be traced back to a single ancient ancestor that lived about 4 billion years ago. This organism, called Luca, probably had only a few hundred genes, just enough to let it make energy from hydrogen, turn carbon dioxide into organic molecules, and process nitrogen. It likely lived around hydrothermal vents, using natural metal-rich minerals and chemical gradients to power its life processes, much like some vent-dwelling microbes do today. Molecular clocks calibrated against the fossil record place the divergence of bacteria and RCHAEA near 3.9 Ga, implying that life's diversification followed swiftly after its origin. This rapid appearance supports a model where habitability and biogenesis coincided soon after planetary stabilization. As life spread beyond vents, microbial communities colonized shallow waters. Layers of cyanobacteria and other microbes trap sediments, forming laminated structures known as stromatolites. These living carpets represented one of the earliest large-scale interactions between biology and geology. Through photosynthesis, they began to alter the chemistry of oceans and atmosphere. The oldest confirmed stromatolites, layered structures built by microbes, 
are found in Western Australia's Pilbara region and South Africa's Barberton Mountains, both about 3.5 billion years old. Their rounded shapes, fine layers, and chemical fingerprints show that they were formed by living organisms, not just natural mineral processes. Even older possible examples from Greenland, dating to around 3.8 billion years ago, are still debated but hint that microbial life using sunlight or chemical energy may have begun even earlier. Stromatolites form as microbial films secrete sticky extracellular polymers that trap carbonate or silicate particles. Successive generations grow atop one another, producing microlamine 0.1 to 1 mm thick. These accretionary structures provide the earliest macroscopic fossils of life, visible in outcrop even billions of years later. At first, most organisms were chemotrophs, gaining energy from reactions between hydrogen, methane, and sulfides. But at some point, microbes learned to harness sunlight. Primitive anoxygenic photosynthesis used iron or hydrogen sulfide as electron donors, yielding elemental sulfur or ferric oxides instead of oxygen. Later, a new lineage, ancestors of modern cyanobacteria, evolved to use water itself as the electron donor, releasing O as a byproduct. This innovation transformed the planet. Genetic studies suggest that microbes capable of making oxygen through photosynthesis evolved very early, perhaps as far back as 3.5 billion years ago. Ancient stromatolites from that time already show traces of rust-like iron minerals, evidence that oxygen was being produced in small amounts. The key proteins that drive photosynthesis appear to have split from common ancestors deep in Earth's early history. By about 2.9 billion years ago, chemical clues in rocks show that oxygen was starting to escape into the air and react with minerals on land. The biochemical trick was the evolution of the MNCAO cluster within Photosystem II, capable of splitting water into protons, electrons, and oxygen. Each molecule of O liberated by these microscopic engines carried profound geochemical consequences. Iron dissolved in seawater oxidized to rust, forming banded iron formations that now line ancient cratons. The ratio of carbon types in ancient rocks gives one of the clearest clues that life has existed on Earth for billions of years. Living things prefer to use the lighter form of carbon, which leaves a distinct chemical fingerprint behind. In very old rocks, minerals show a mix of heavier carbon, while the carbon from ancient organic matter is much lighter, a difference that can only be explained by life. This pattern appears as far back as 3.8 billion years ago, showing that Earth's carbon cycle, driven by living organisms, has been running almost since the planet began. By 3.5 Ga the Earth supported a global microbial biosphere. Oceans teemed with bacterial and archaeal life, cycling carbon, sulfur, and nitrogen. Methanogens produced methane, maintaining a greenhouse that compensated for the faint sun iron and sulfur oxidizers colonized hydrothermal settings, while photosynthetic mats spread across continental shelves. Life had become a planetary force, altering atmospheric composition and sediment chemistry. Sedimentary parietes from 3.47 Ga show multiple sulfur isotope anomalies pointing to microbial sulfur cycling under an anoxic sky. Nitrogen isotopes from the same strata indicate biological nitrogen fixation via the molybdenum-dependent nitrogenase enzyme, demonstrating that key biochemical pathways were already ancient. Together, photosynthetic microbes and methane-producing organisms helped keep early Earth warm. Their activity released both carbon dioxide and methane into the air, creating a natural greenhouse that prevented the planet from freezing. Sunlight broke down some of the methane, forming a thin orange haze, much like the one around Saturn's moon Titan, which blocked harmful ultraviolet rays while still trapping enough heat to keep the planet comfortable. The gradual rise of oxygen did not yet transform the atmosphere. Iron and sulfur sinks absorbed most O. But by about 2.5 Ga, these buffers would saturate, triggering the Great Oxidation Event. That later transformation belongs to the Proterozoic, 
but its foundations were laid here in the Archean seas, in the humble metabolic experiments of stromatolites and cyanobacteria that learned to turn light and water into power. Life's influence on the planet had begun its long ascent. Minerals like pyrite and uraninite, which can only exist where there's little or no oxygen, vanished from river deposits about 2.4 billion years ago. At the same time, red-stained rocks and unusual sulfur signatures began to appear, clear signs that oxygen had finally started to build up in the air. This marked the turning point from Earth's oxygen-free past to a new, more oxidized world. The first sparks of life were not a single event but a continuum, from minerals to molecules, from metabolism to replication, from chemistry to heredity. Within a few hundred million years of planetary calm, Earth changed forever. Self-organizing systems began to evolve, reproduce, and reshape their environment. By the end of this episode, life was established across the planet, preparing for the next great leap, the oxygenation of the atmosphere and the flowering of complex cells that would follow in the Proterozoic world.